and welcome to today's design news webinar, Medical Robotics and the Role of Ultra-Precise Motion Control, sponsored by Bokers, Inc., Performance Motion Devices, <clears throat> Naxon, and Nomax, and broadcast by Informa. I'm Daphne Allen, editor of Design News, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. Our webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media, and participate in the Q&A that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. Toward the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now, on to the presentation medical robotics, and the role of ultra-precise motion control. Joining us today from the MedTech company Promoxo is Chief Technology Officer Alexander Nassov. Alec will share how the Promoxo platform works, and he'll also explore generally how motion control and motor technology can play a role in achieving procedural precision. I'm also pleased to welcome two speakers from our sponsors. Prabhakar Gorashankaran, Vice President of Engineering and Strategy for Performance Motion Devices, and Peter Van Beek, Business Development Manager for Maxon Medical. To learn more about all our speakers, please visit the BIOS widget. Now, Alex, over to you. Thank you, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Alec Natsa, the, the CTO from Promaxo. We're a medical device technology company that's building an MRI for in-office use, um, and here to talk about uh, the real-time interoperative imaging capabilities that our system offers. When you think about imaging in clinical oncology, there's a wide arrange, arrangement of different imaging modalities, and this includes x-ray, ultrasound, optical imaging, SPECT, PET, um, but MRI is really one of the, the mainstays of the of diagnosis and treatment of different types of cancers. And that's mainly because this imaging modality images the tissues directly, and it can image soft tissues as well as identify different types of contrast between those tissue types. And there's a growing body of research that really shows how we can expand the role of MRI for the treatment of prostate cancer, for identifying and treating breast cancer, and we really want to bring that capability into the office setting. What are some of the limitations, though, for why MRI hasn't been used in the in-office setting? It's mainly because MRIs are very large. They have extensive infrastructure. They require shielding, a large footprint. They're very heavy, so you have to reinforce the floors. And so for this reason, they're usually on the first or ground floors. There's only so many of them in the world. Uh, in the U.S., there's about 38 MRIs per million people, and globally, it's about uh, five per million people. And this is quite pr problematic from the standpoint of actually being able to get into an MRI, where there's long wait times. Um, right now, it's about an average of two to four weeks to, to get an MRI if you have a non-emergency situation. The, uh, to buy one, it's quite expensive. And then also to maintain them, it's quite expensive. You have quite um, exhaustive uh, maintenance schedules that you have to do for the MRI to keep it in, in imaging shape. Now, while MRI, um, has non-ionizing radiation, meaning you don't actually cause any cellular damage, there are operational and safety concerns with, uh, with an MR system, a large field MR system. And this includes the cryogens that are used to cool the MR, that if they ever leak out, it can cause significant damage uh, to patients or to clinicians, as well as to um, robotics and other medical uh, or, or uh, metal implants that you might have that get close to the system. Um, as as one knows, it's a magnet, so therefore, um, magnetized metal can become quite problematic when a patient is nearby. 
And then for those who've actually had an MRI, the, one of the often complaint, one of the complaints that you hear is that it's very claustrophobic. There's loud noises. You so you go fit inside a tube, and and people don't like it. You have to stay stationary for a long time, and so a lot of these problems are one of the reasons why an MRI hasn't been taken into an office setting. So that's where Promaxo comes in. We've actually created a MRI platform that consists of the imaging device, the MRI a robotic uh, component for treatment um, and a AI treatment or AI platform to take advantage of all the information that we gather. Our MRI is FDA cleared and we're planning on doing uh, screening, diagnosis and treatment. So we can identify suspicious regions, we can diagnose whether or not those regions are cancerous and then we can go back in and treat them as necessary. So the first component is the Permaxo MR. Um, here you can see the MRI in a clinical setting. Uh, this is uh, down in Mississippi. It has a touchscreen user interface. There's no RF shielding required, so you can place it in a room like this with other metallic uh, equipment nearby. We have the three traditional styles of MR imaging uh, sequences, the T1, the T2, and the DWI sequences. We have a non-invasive wearable receive coil, so there's no endorectal coils, which is a, a big concern for patients and high field systems. It fits into doorways and elevators. So this is actually in the fourth floor of an office building. Um, so you can get it into an, an, a traditional elevator. Um, but one of the main big advances of this system is that it's a single sided open face design. So you can kind of see how the, the patient bed is up against the MR and you don't go inside a tube. You actually are imaged right next to it. And so this allows us to design a hole, for example, to do the robotic um, treatment techniques, as well as you can bring the robotics um, and access the, the patient from the side. And the clinician can also be uh, right next to the patient and able to access them as necessary. So it really opens up uh, different ways of treating and helping the patient. The technology itself has, is covered by several hundred patents at this point. Um, and it really stems from the novel magnet form factor where we used different types of alg uh, optimization algorithms to design and shrink down the system that exists in a traditional hosp hospital setting into an office-based setting. Uh, we have quick imager imaging gradients and fast pulse sequences, and these are kind of specialized MR um, components. We have unique uh, radio frequency transmission and reception networks. This allows us to image uh, and uh, receive signals from deep within the patient, even though it's only a single-sided system. And then all these different types of uh, technology improvements are kind of held together by the glue of our nonlinear reconstruction algorithms, which really are now only feasible because of modern advancements in computing technology where we can leverage GPU parallelization techniques. So math that would normally have taken weeks to months to solve now takes seconds to minutes to solve. And that allows us to do our imaging in a much faster time. So the Promaxo MRI has been validated. We've looked at the navigation accuracy, the registration accuracy, the patient motion accuracy, and they all come down to less than two and a half milliliters, depending upon the specific style of accuracy that we're discussing. And this took place with urologists and radiologists to identify um, the targets both um, on our system and on a, a ground truth system as well. And these types of accuracies are what's important when we discuss what we need to do from the robotic standpoint. How accurate does the robot need to be? How repeatable does the robot need to be? All, these, all this information feeds then into that system itself. And it can change around the technology that you might require to actually re achieve the accuracy that you need. The next big leg of uh, the Permaxo system is our AI network. We have two main components. One is a simple AI image enhancement where we leverage the low field um, low SNR imaging, and we use a UNET or and a combination of different UNETs to develop a denoising algorithm so we can improve the SNR of these images. And this is, has been FDA cleared. It's, it's, a, it's a novel um, uh, AI imaging enhancement technique, and um, we're excited to have it in our system. And the final sort of the end all that you would expect with the system as we develop this entire platform is the ability to be able to do computer aided diagnostics based upon the data that we gather from both the MR, from the robot, from the treatment, from the pathology lab, we try to co 
correlate all this information, build an AI network that can then allow us to predict for future patients whether or not a patient um, is suspected of having cancer now or in the future. And that's where we're gonna try and gather all this information from the robot um, going forwards. And then lastly, the third leg of our system is our MR compatible robot. It is multifaceted um, in that we can have different styles of end effectors attached to it for different treatment planning techniques. It provides live planning, meaning we're able to do the biopsy under live guidance. And we'll have, again, a component of AI involved with this that will help do data-driven uh, path planning and tissue characterization. Here you'll see, I think, yep, okay, here you'll see a video of our current um, robot that fits within the system. It's a standalone device that is accessed from the back of the MRI. It travels through the axis aperture that's between it, and it uh, moves around in five degrees of freedom a biopsy end effector that allows us to take different uh, biopsies from different sections of the prostate. This end effector um, can be switched out for various different types of treatment techniques, for example, brachytherapy or laser ablation or cryotherapy. I think it's that kept moving. Um, one of the most important things for robotic guidance of uh, live robotic guidance of the system is being able to accurately uh, predict and see where the needles are within the MR space. And so we've been able to show that we can do that under different styles of planes of imaging, um, and we can identify that with a high degree of um, accuracy, under one millimeter of accuracy. And when we combine all this information together, so we combine the T2 images, um, we combine this path plan, we combine the robot, we have a right, nice, easy clinical workflow that allows us to image the patient, select the region that we want to target either for a biopsy or for treatment uh, planning, and then perform the intervention, whether or not that's done by an individual or if that's done by uh, the robot under the guidance of a clinician. Currently, um, we've actually shown uh, clinical superiority over the standard of care when we do this in a clinical setting. So right now we have about a 71% detection cancer rate, um, and that's been 23% more uh, than the standard of care in terms of identifying uh, clinically significant cancers. And we've also upstaged the final diagnosis of cancers by 33%. So that means the clinician is actually able to give the right treatment planning uh, to the patient because they have the actual information that they require. And we do all of this with less cores. So our, we take about two to five cores from the actual target location, while the standard of care does 12 to 14 cores. So there's a lot less um, invasive procedures necessary. So not only um, does the patient actually um, have a better treatment outcome, but uh, it is an attractive reimbursement model for the clinician who is buying the system. So we talked about how traditional MRs are quite expensive. Um, this system, uh, because CPT codes, relevant CPT codes exist, the clinician is actually able to pay for it currently um, and recur their expenses within a, a year to a year and a half. So it's very attractive from the standpoint of a business perspective, as well as to a patient outcome perspective. They can actually improve the outcomes of these patients. And so we have a growing body of publications. We've been in many trade journals. We've been in some scientific journals as well. And we're, we're very happy to get our, our devices out there at helping patients. Um, and I thank you all for your time. And I think right now it's uh, back to Daphne. Thank you, Alex, very much for explaining the Promoxo platform and um, for giving us a little bit of information about the robot and showing um, the video. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like now to turn um, it over to a couple speakers who will explore um, some of the motion control and motor technology um, that's available for medical robotics. So um, we'd like to start by welcoming Prob from Performance Motion Devices. Thank you, Daphne. Um, thanks, Alec, for uh, that presentation. So this, I'm just going to take a slightly different angle just to uh, talk about the technology that goes behind, like what Alec was talking about, some of these MRI and some of the medical robotics uh, uh, equipment. <clears throat> so what we've seen, uh, so we PMD does motion control chips and boards and modules uh, for very precise motion. 
So it's used in a lot of surgical robotics uh, companies for precise motion. And some of the key things we see often is they require reliable, easy transport and efficiency. So we kind of boiled it down to key considerations. Uh, so one being the weight um, and the power, uh, obviously, that the drive itself is going to take, and then the heat uh, that it generates, because it, that kind of ties back into the reliability of the whole unit, uh, because it has to, especially in medical applications that they've gone through FDA qualification, the product itself lasts 15, 20 years. So it's it's a long life cycle product. And so they tend to want to focus on really high performance in terms of weight, power, and heat. So there's a few different approaches. I just wanted to highlight one a technique that a lot of people are starting to use in mobile robotics and surgical robotics is trying to use this uh, closed loop stepper where you traditionally have a brushless DC motor for very high performance or uh, a brushed motor, which is an older technology. The stepper motor doesn't get you the precision in terms of motion, in terms of positioning. Um, so there's a new trend that we're seeing a lot more of is they take a, a stepper motor, add an encoder to it, so you can kind of get position feedback. And it kind of brings it back and acts like a, a two-phase BLDC motor. And you can kind of operate it in a sweet spot rather than moving in micro steps, you can kind of position it in between. And that kind of gets into lower noise and uh, less heat produced. So this is just to highlight one uh, unique use case of motion control that we've seen in newer applications. And tying into what um, Alec had pointed out in terms of uh, actual control, uh, he was talking about very high precision um, and having more power because it's it all ties in to the weight of the machine and the interoperability. So this is one of our newer uh, uh, products. It's a all-in-one kind of a, a intelligent drive. As you can see on the picture on the right, it's a pretty small. It's only uh, inch and a half by inch and a half. So these are kind of used in surgical robotics and cobots and uh, mobile robotics where they kind of put one drive uh, per end axis. And so it controls the motor. You get uh, all the, the wiring and the cabling goes locally to that drive. And this drive actually has, it's a three card stack. It has a processor, it has a motion control chip that we make and a power amplifier. We can drive up to one kilowatt. So this makes building a machine from a system or a machine builder point of view, it makes their life a lot easier. Because people in the medical robotics and the the medical lab automation space want to focus on the science of the what they're doing and not worry about motion. Uh, so they want a third party provider to kind of help them and take care of it. So this drive is like an all in one and has ethernet, all sorts of host interfaces and this unique uh, networking capability to kind of uh, daisy chain a bunch of these drives together where everything is synchronized and it acts like a single multi-axis machine on the back end. Uh, me being an engineer, I, I like I, I like visuals and like to be able to see uh, what an end machine looks like. So in this case, I'm just highlighting uh, a robotic arm. Um, and as you can see, this shows how small these drives are. So you can actually put the drive, it's a solderable drive, so you put it on a card. It's a passive card with connectors and you tie it into the motor and the encoder feedback. And so you have one per joint and it makes it really serviceable and you're able to just replace the drive and uh, kind of uh, move on with the equipment. So, and this kind of gives you a, a, a list of parts that go into a robotic arm construction. One other application that's very, very popular in lab automation, if you take a look at, COVID testing, right? On the back end, all the PCR samples that are collected goes into a massive uh, lab that automates all the testing. And the majority of them are running on gantries. So this kind of gives you uh, a quick idea of the size of it and what the design looks like of a, of a gantry application. So it is a three axis XYZ uh, drive stage and it takes three of the N series drives. 
puts them on a card and then you could see that's how small it is relative to the mechanics and the, and the structure of the machine. And then the last one I want to kind of highlight is uh, a handheld medical kind of application where this is uh, more battery operated. So it has to be really low power. You have to be able to power down. So this is a handheld stand uh, for scanning and other uh, medical diagnostic applications. You can see that it's it's a fully IP67 case that the end machine designer has built. And it has the two drives with the passive card and the connectors that they need to be able to connect to the probes that they want to. So this visual kind of, I usually tend to do well with visuals. So this kind of gives you an idea of how machine designers, the struggles they go through to make it as small as they can and the end series drivers helps them in, in some aspects of it. I think that's a quick snapshot. So Daphne, I'll hand it back to you. Great, thank you, Prob, very much. Um, now I'd like to welcome Peter from Maxon. Uh, thank you, Daphne. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about Maxon Motors. And um, for those that are unfamiliar, um, we are a um, Swiss based, um, privately held global company. And the US division of Maxon provides sales to the US and Mexico, um, motor and gear production engineering and contract manufacturing. Um, Maxon at its core is an engineering company that develops and builds world-class electric drive systems. And what's nice about our product line is that you can piece together whatever you, whatever you might need. It's modular in its form. Do you need a sub-fractional DC brushed or brushless motor or a servo assembly consisting of a motor, a gearhead, a sensor in the back, and drive electronics. In other words, a complete mechatronic drive system. We provide standard catalog, semi-custom, and fully customized assemblies, even complete drug and feeding pumps. Um, Maxon does not shy away from cutting edge technologies to solve the impossible motion control application, be it a Mars rover or a helicopter drone um, extreme downhole oil drilling head, or a surgical robot. Maxon is the preferred uh, drive electronics system supplier for surgical robots, um, maintaining life, repairing the body, determining the cause of illness, uh, rehabilitation therapy, and prosthetics. Uh, in essence, making life better for the sick. Um, as this slide kind of depicts, um, we are in, in a lot of these applications of, for example, insulin pumps, dialysis, feeding and drug delivery pumps, in-body heart pumps. Maxon makes the whole uh, assembly, including the motor, which you can see in the kind of the heart depiction over on the right side here. Uh, it's a turbine with the motor attached, all biocompatible materials. Surgical robots, um, we play in the haptic side and the surgeon console and the end effectors on the, in the surgical carts. Um, surgical power tools for brain, back, knee, ankle, and hip surgeries. Radiation cancer therapy, um, the defining, uh, the beams defined by multi-leaves, um, co collimator head, uh, which is all positioned by motion servo control motors. Uh, imaging equipment, atherectomy devices. Um, Maxim was actually one of the first motors uh, to be placed in a major atherectomy device for commercial use, replacing the historic pneumatic power. And this was a very disruptive technology back in the 2000s. Atherectomy, if you don't know what that is, it's a basically glorified cleaning of the veins or sanding of the plaque. Uh, rehabilit rehabilitation, exoskeleton equipment, and prosthesis. Uh, after an injury or a stroke, for example, and uh, dental tools. Maxon is often used just because of our high performance, um, high efficiency, and quiet, consistent, reliable manufacturing. Moving on to the last slide, um, why Maxon? Um, we have, we're accredited to ISO 9000 and 1345 qualifications. 
Um, Maxon processes are designed and validated for change control and documentation to MDR and FDA requirements. Device makers bring their projects to Maxon to have the benefit of working with engineers on the sales, project, and R&D levels. In close collaboration with our customers, we develop drive systems tailored to the customer's specifications using simple and complex modifications. Um, fully customized subassemblies are possible, for example, an insulin pump or a drug pump, specifically designed for the medical industry in, within, in, in mind. We also make motors that are autoclavable, saline, low and high pH chemistry tolerant. We offer hollow shafted variants, adaptable gearheads of all types and ratios, sensors like resolvers, encoders, and tachometers, which can go on the motors, and drive electronics for both speed and torque and positioning control, um, which can be, there's catalog variants and fully customizable. Ver versions as well. That brings me to the end of uh, my slides. Daphne, I send it back to you. Thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate that. Um, and um, thank you to all three of our speakers. I sincerely appreciate your um, presentation today. Um, before we begin with our Q&A, um, I'd like to direct our audience's attention to our webinar survey. It's available on the right of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can reopen the widget by clicking the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in our survey allows us to serve you better. So now on to the Q&A portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate, just type your question in the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If we're not able to answer all submitted questions during today's webinar, we'll be sure to share them with our speakers um, who can reply offline. So um, I wanted to start, um, have a, a couple questions for Alec on the Promoxo system. Um, one is, um, does the MRI provide a suggested path for treatment? Yes, uh, so that's a great question. Um, the, the idea behind doing air interoperative imaging is that we can image the patient, look at the data, and suggest a path for the robot or the clinician to take to reach either the target for a biopsy or for treatment planning. And um, we do have the, we are developing the capability for an AI algorithm to uh, best choose a path, right, to do path planning with respect to that. Um, but the clinician can always um, either choose to reject or, um, you know, adjust the path as necessary. Okay, excellent. Um, and are you able to comment on whether or not the patient would be awake during the procedure? <laughs> so this is actually uh, very specific to the specific clinical sites. Uh, some sites prefer to have the patient to sleep. Some prefer sort of twilight sedation. But in terms of just general imaging, you can be awake. Um, depending upon the type of procedure that they're doing, they, they might choose to put the patient to sleep, but that's dependent upon the site themselves. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much, Alec. Um, I have some questions um, potentially for all our speakers. Um, uh, let's see. Um, one is, um, what advances are you seeing related to the sterilization and usable lifetime of the drive systems in robotics? Um, Peter, do you want to start? Um, oh, my, my, I'm sorry. My mute was stuck there for a second. Um, yes, I can start with that one. Um, Maxon already makes autoclavable motors, um, uh, hall sensored versions, or set what they call censored version motors and non censored. The sensor list actually has a autoclavable cycles of up to 2000. Uh, so you can put an autoclave that many times. Um, for the hall sensored version, it's a thousand. Um, however, we're working on uh, what we're calling the new medical motor, and um, that will have even improved performance beyond that. Okay, excellent. Um, not sure, Prob, if you have any um, anything to add to that, or Alec, if you have seen anything. 
Yeah, I think uh, we've seen our end machine designers, right? Like the, the medical designers do enclosures that are completely autoclavable. That way they can use electronics from anywhere. And they kind of put it, we see that in uh, aerospace and uh, defense applications too, where they kind of make an enclosure that's IP rated and that, that way they can kind of take off the shelf electronics and put it in. Um, so we've seen that in some applications. Yeah, and I think I kind of commented it from from our our side. You know, we try to keep uh, the amount of components that need to be autoclave or sterilized to a minimum, so that way it's it's an easier uh, clinical workflow. Um, but it is kind of critical to make you know to have those types of technologies that you can sterilize. You think I think in some cases you don't have to autoclave if you're draping like a surgical robot or something like that, but. Um, what we find in power tools for Maxon anyways, um, if you're even sealing in an enclosed environment, it, it just seems like with the uh, normal autoclave cycle, where you have pressure and vacuum, high temperatures, that um, chemistry or saline or water actually have ingress into that enclosure, and then it, it will kill the motor. So um, autoclave, autoclave motors are still used, even though they're sealed completely in, in a container. So that's the best approach for a power tool. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, how does repeatability and accuracy influence um, product design choices? Yeah, I sort of alluded to this um, when I was discussing sort of the accuracy and the navigation accuracy and the, the targeting accuracy of our system. It really comes back to what is the, you know, what are the clinicians currently doing and what kind of accuracy do you need to have? And then that allows you to feed into what kind of engineering uh, motors you might require to do what you're trying to, you know, achieve. Um, and, and that's, you know, as any good engineer starts out with is you have your the requirements that you need to meet, and then you can go through the, what technological solution works for that. Yeah, one example I have on the PMD side is so we are designed into some uh, microscope stages. So there it's a nanometer precision. And what we uh, see is the our drives are super repeatable and precise. But what ends up happening is uh, the mechanical construction of your machine there's some non-linearities, right? So as an example, in the microscope stage, it traverses 90% of the path accurately, very precisely, but at the end, when it's close to its limit and it's gonna stop, there's some mechanical instability. So there's techniques that people do with feed forward and stuff like that that we implement in our drives. They can load a table and do profiles for motion and then say, oh, as you get to the end point where they know there's mechanical instability, they can add an offset to get to the level of precision they need. So we see this a lot in uh, nanometer precision, like microscope stages and all those. And it's slowly, all those techniques are available in the drive, so they're slowly finding its way into surgical robotics and other areas that are not as precise as these uh, microscope stages, for example. Excellent. Um, Peter, do you have anything to share about either repeatability or accuracy? Um, yeah, I would say that as uh, Prab was saying, um, I think you, you, you're trying to reduce the, um, what, we, what we, we might refer to as backlash or slop in a system, your mechanical system. So if you have a motor and a gear, um, you can maybe in some cases use a gearbox that's maybe like a harmonic where it has very low backlash and play. Um, but, you know, typically it's it's a long line. So you're having some nonlinearities and you're, you're trying to eliminate those as best as possible. But um, what I've seen done in industry a lot is uh, redundant sensing. So you actually have a sensor on the output. So you know where the final, whatever you're trying to move, you know its position and you also have potentially an encoder or sensor on the motor. So that's helping with its commutation, for example, or its motion profiles. But in the end, you have the sensor, which is is determining that you're at the right spot and you're having the, the correct accuracy. Uh, I, think, I think over time too, you have some other issues that kind of creep up with where 
and lubricants that kind of dry out over time with mechanical systems. So um, maintenance is probably something to be considered there, but also I think just have mechanical wear of components. Yeah, Which just, yeah just adding on to what Peter said, yeah, the other technique that he's talking about, the dual encoder where they have, we see them in camming and gearing applications. They would have the position of what you're trying to control and then a second encoder or a sensor to determine your end position. So and you can kind of compensate for those in some of the algorithms. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, what impact um, does an MRI's magnetic field have on the drive system's magnet and encoder functionality and how can it be mitigated? Yeah, that's a great question. So a traditional MR would typically not allow any mechanical motor or electromechanical motor uh, to operate within its imaging volume unless you had some very heavy duty shielding and, and bolted to the floor potentially. Um, for the Pramaxo system, because the magnet is so much smaller and, and, and lighter and the field that it creates is, is, is weaker than a traditional system, um, you can bring um, servo motors and, and brushed motors nearby. You can actually put them inside the bore if you wanted to and it would still operate. Uh, the, the only, the main trick I would say to these types of systems or these low field systems is the way in which they interact with the encoding step. So what, what uh, uh, Peter and Bob were referring to before, in that if you're trying to identify you know, what step the motor is at or what angle it's at, um, if it's magnetically encoded, you're going to lose that functionality unless you try to shield it. And usually that shielding comes at a, a space constraint cost. Um, alternatively, you can switch to optical encoding uh, to, uh, to control those motors. And then sort of piggybacking on what they were talking about um, previously, uh, you can add a second step, a second, second sort of validation step using the MR imaging itself to say, oh, I think the needle is actually in this location or the, the, you know, the motor put the needle or the end effector in this particular location, but I've imaged it and I now know where it is. And so you can have that feedback into your design. I think, Alex, um, we had talked in a previous conversation where if you do have a, a brushed permanent magnet motor, you could actually put a tube around that, potentially uh, like a Faraday cage of sort, and, it, and the, uh, the MRI's um, generated magnet would um, be nullified that way in some way. Is that, is that an option? Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be copper. It might be some combination of copper and, and sort of a uh, magnetizable material. But yes, you can basically contain or separate the two magnets from each other um, with a material, and you can actually leverage both. I was thinking a ferritic tube, um, but also um, for our spindles or um, ball screws, we can, we can make those out. Maxim makes those out of ceramic in some cases, so. Oh, even better. Yeah, that wouldn't be uh, conductive to a magnetic field. Okay. Excellent. Um, wanted to ask, um, is it possible to synchro synchronize motion across multiple axes? Yeah, it's a pretty common application if you look at any uh, surgical robot, right? Even I'm sure the MRI, there's a lot of there's linear motion, there's a ro rotary motion and stuff, and there's a lot of trigger points. So uh, in with the PMD stuff, it's we have we can synchronize across axes. So it looks like a seamless multi-axis machine, and all the axes are triggered at the right points. And in some cases where they do a little bit more advanced profiling, they want to trigger off a second axis move before the first axis completes, so they can set breakpoints and kind of kind of uh, orchestrate the, the motion of each of the axes. So if they don't want perfect synchronization of the axes for some reason, for a mechanical design, they can kind of offset some of the moves if they want. So it's like perfectly synchronized, uh, which is very common request um, in most motion applications. And there are some cases where they want to try to get rid of some mechanical uh, imbalances by triggering some moves ahead of other axis moves and stuff. So, uh, it's a pretty common request, and we do that. Okay. Okay, excellent. Um, also wanted to ask, um, 
what the benefits of distributed versus centralized mo motor control in uh, Cobots or Robux? Yeah, it's a pretty, uh, so some of the traditional, uh, like the large ABBs and cookers of the world, a uh, lot of them have done centralized, uh, where there's a big controller, uh, where it's all, all the controls are done in the outside box, and then they're just sending position and velocity and time kind of parameters to each of the drives at the axes. So all the brains are in a central pattern. But what we're seeing with some of the newer mobile robots um, is it's a distributed architecture where you have a drive per motor or drive per axle, and they're independently running all the profiles and stuff for each of those endpoints. And they're just exchanging uh, information saying, oh, we've reached this endpoint. So the distributed architecture, the main advantage is it minimizes the, the weight. So all you have is a drive per motor, and then you have just the local connection. You need power and a, a host interface to go to it. So it minimizes the amount of uh, cabling that you have to do. And then in a centralized, the disadvantage is it, you have to have high speed uh, transport of uh, packets because the central machine is making all the decisions of all the moves and kind of communicating it to all the axes. Um, so it's different approaches. Uh, what we're seeing is newer mobile robotics and uh, field robots and stuff are starting to move towards uh, distributed architecture because in their case, it's smaller and there's not really a common central controller. Okay, okay excellent. Um, do you support path planning and other custom motion features? Yeah, actually, like Alec was mentioning, right? It's uh, path planning is very critical. So what what we do is we call this user defined profile mode. You can actually load a table of a whole bunch of points of paths that you want to traverse, um, and so it automatically once it reaches a point, it moves on to the next point, and you can uh, attach profiles to each point. So you can actually traverse the whole path and actually define the profile that you want for each of those paths, the sub segments. So you can actually create pretty uh, sophisticated motion where you can divide your entire move into multiple sub paths and then you can plan the path with different profiles and stuff. So it's like Alec was mentioning, it's very common for surgical robotics, the MRI kind of stuff where as they get closer to certain points, the, the path changes and they want to be able to predict it and provide the operator the option to change the path. Do you allow for feedback to be included during that path to, to sort of make decisions and switch between different paths? Yeah, so you can actually, we have had one couple of customers that have loaded like two alternate paths. It's basically memory, right? You load a table of points in memory and based on breakpoints, you get a response back saying, oh, I've reached this point in the path. And then you can either trigger the continue on that path or switch over to an alternate path. Like you were talking about for the surgeon to kind of decide, do they want to continue on the pre-set path or do they want to change it? Um, okay. okay, excellent, thank you both, appreciate that. Um, we have a question about um, whether it's possible to get a motor design kit that would have a very tiny effector to test it on a bench, perhaps something that could carve or draw on a material so um, this person could see the performance. Is this possible? Um, from Maxon's perspective, we don't really have motor kits. Um, typically, we're sizing every motor based on the torque and speed requirements of that particular application. So um, I would probably advise Roger to contact Maxon and we can put him in contact with a regional engineer and um, they could go over the parameters he's needing, what he's trying to achieve, and then we could best select um, a motor assembly because literally we have a one inch thick catalog and, and millions of products. So you have to basically select it and define it down more. Okay, thank you. Um, can anyone comment on using vision to automate positioning or alignment? Um, for example, end effector positioning, part pickup, or placement. 
Yeah, I can kind of comment that on that as well. I mean, this is something that's actually been done in the MR space quite often, and we're incorporated as well. You know, if you're doing something quick, um, you want to kind of align patient, both patient motion. You know, where is the patient within our imaging field of view? Where is the robotics? Um, and you can include different imaging modalities to do that. And so one of them is um, vision, right? You can use cameras and depth sensors with respect to that, um, or you can use laser guidance um, and you know laser depth, for example. And that helps you just do quick bulk uh, motion. But then, of course, for medical robotics, you care about what's happening inside the body. So the outside of the body, you can kind of align and, and register. But then what's going on inside and that's where the MR comes in and that's where the robotic feedback comes in. Yeah, okay. machine vision is actually very popular in some of these newer mobile robotics spaces. They actually have GPS and so a lot of the warehouse automation robots you would see have machine vision to actually read barcodes and predict kind of obstacles. So some of them, some of the warehouse automation ones run on tracks where they just read a barcode and go and fix paths. But some of the newer ones are free flowing, so they kind of have machine vision to predict obstacles and stuff and when to break and all that stuff. Okay, excellent. Um, how does mechanical precision affect intraoperative imaging? So Peter and Robert were discussing this. It really comes back to um, trying to reach your target. And so if you have, you need to have feedback control. Um, we do that with respect to the MR imaging itself, where you can you can predict where your robot and your end effector is going, um, but then you actually need to image it and verify it and correct any errors that you have. It also comes back to in terms of precision. If you're doing, for example, remote center of motion, where you make one. Um, biopsy or one um, hole within the patient, right? So one axis aperture inside the patient um, to limit the number of um, holes you're making in them that you have to come back to the same location and then readjust uh, going forward. Okay. Um, thank you. And we have a question regarding um, impotence, impe impedance control in new drivers. Um, Peter, is that something you might want to answer? Impedance? Um, Impedance, yeah. Yeah. I, I think he might be referring to inductive chokes. And yes, we, um, well, I would just say this Maxon controls are designed to drive Maxon motors and have the correct balancing of inductance um, within them in most cases. So, um, if he needed more help with that or to learn some details, he again could contact Maxon. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, and then I just have a general question about um, how motion control drive systems can maintain the desired levels of accuracy and repeatability over the life of a medical robotic system. Yeah, I think the, some of this comes down to the mechanical repeatability and stuff. And there's a lot of um, research and work being done on predictive maintenance and stuff. So like bearings and like mechanical parts wearing out. The electronics itself survive a long time, right? So they are as accurate and repeatable as they're designed to be, but the, the mechanics is where the wear and tear happens. So there's a lot of um, predictive maintenance. And like Peter talked about where maintaining stuff uh, comes into play in terms of your know, precision. So I think there's, it's easy to maintain. For either you have to have a maintenance schedule or you do some of these more advanced uh, predictive maintenance kind of stuff because the more the drivers are so close to the motor and the mechanics. So you, you can actually tell when things are either failing or going to fail. So some customers of ours have started to add more predictive analytics uh, into their uh, design. Yeah, and I would add to Prob's comments. I mean, typically in a motor system or a mechanical system, so um, what in particular for Maxon motors, uh, there's very linear relationships of current draw to torque production. So as the mechanical system wears, um, uh, the current is going to just going to start creeping up over time, and potentially, for example, you had lubricants in a bearing, or in the ball bearings of a motor, or 
um, spindle, um, you know, it's just going to be more friction, more friction in the system. So it's all going to lead to current. So if you if you have some kind of system um, that is monitoring that on a kind of continuous basis, um, that's one way to be predictive. And so if it's getting through a certain certain threshold, you're saying, oh, that's kind of setting off some alarms, perhaps in the control system saying, yeah, is, something is very wrong here. Um, but I think what Maxon in general, but it's very hard to do, recommends is that you would take, for example, 10 assemblies and you would put them into your specific application with all of its uniqueness, radial loads, axial loads, speeds, torques, et cetera, um, and environment, um, and run them to failure and take the average and it's going to be pretty predictive of like how long you would expect that mechanical system to last so i, I hope those comments are helpful yeah definitely thank you all very very much i appreciate it um i think that's about all the time we have for questions today um i definitely want to thank um alec prob and peter your time and your effort in answering our questions. Really appreciate that. Um, want to thank our sponsors, Performance Motion Devices, Maxon, Bokers Inc., and Milmax. And I also definitely want to thank everyone in our audience. Um, thank you for your attendance and your participation. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to the event. This webinar is copyright 2022 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned or copyrighted by Informa Markets, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, Alec Nassif, Prab Goroshankson, and Peter Van Beek, I'm Daphne Allen with Design News. Thank you all very much for your time, and have a great day. You too, Daphne. Thank you.